keeps intact. What is it? It's disgusting to me. So don't know. It's the area. It's ridiculous. Standing tall, the testers reach for the skies to stop a giant incinerator near their homes. And the sacking of a city category marks the Viking invasion that took place a thousand years ago today. Also tonight, the foster pup who could be our pride of Britain, Simon Parkin and the weather where you are. Plus, on target, Paralympic tickets go on sale as the region's athletes gear up for gold and set a new world record on the way. I love this game because it makes you move, it makes you feel like you've really done some exercise. And is he swimming it or drinking it? The comedian who's finding his charity swim a little too hard to stomach. Good evening to you. We have been demanding more police on the beat for years. It's recognised as a visible deterrent. So why then are there plans to halve the number of community support officers in one part of Kent? The group responsible for helping police keep crime low in Medway says it has been kept in the dark about the latest round of cutbacks. The group's chairman says he's shocked and wants an urgent meeting with the chief constable. Ian McBride has the story. Police community support officers have been a controversial addition to police numbers because they don't have the same powers as regular officers, but they are cheaper. They've become the visible face of policing on the streets and have helped to cut crime. But Kent Police has to find £50 million of savings over the next four years. And as part of that, 1,000 civilian jobs will be lost. The PCSOs are classed as civilians, not officers. Mike O'Brien is chairman of the Community Safety Partnership in Medway. It works with the police to cut crime. But he says he wasn't consulted about the cuts which could see 35 PCSOs disappearing from the streets of the five Medway towns. I was extremely angry. We've been working very closely over the last 12 months with uh, Kent and Medway Police uh, in negotiations and discussions on the restructuring, and at no time was the uh, mention ever made of uh, uh, reducing the PCSOs. They came completely like a bolt out of the door. There was a PCSO presence on the streets of Raydon today, and local businessman Shane Hales says they've made a big difference. Have an impact where they get into the grassroots of local issues. So, around and about um, where local problems arise and they deal with it at a local level. Um, and certainly, I think they probably stop things evolving too far. And people on the streets of Raynham certainly don't want the numbers reduced. It's ridiculous. It makes people like us not want to come out. It'll be all dreadful because we got there a couple of months ago, so you know there's a lot of unsightly people on the roads and you know, it'd just be awful for everybody. So. I think it's just ridiculous really can't it all down, you know, there's so many hooligans around. I do think it, what they've got now, I think on Friday and Saturday night it would be worse, so personally I think it's a bad thing. Kent Police turned down our request for an interview, but in a statement, they did say no final decision has been made on PCSO numbers. However, the Chief Executive of the Police Authority, the Forces Governing Body, told me that a cut in Medway's numbers is one of the options under consideration. Ian McBride in Chatham, for Meridian tonight. Investigations are underway after a young girl was mugged on her way home from school in Sussex. Three men wearing hoods approached the 12-year-old in Nizelles Avenue in Hove. They tried to go through her bag, then one man grabbed her. She shouted and they ran off empty-handed when a member of the public came to her aid. Construction is due to begin next month on flood defences for Margate seafronts. It'll involve strengthening the harbour arm and the building of a new sea wall. Almost 500 properties in the town are thought to be at risk of flooding. People living near the site of a waste disposal plant planned on green fields near their homes have used a 60-metre crane to show the impact of a proposed chimney. West Sussex County Council has shortlisted Hickstead and Goddard's Green as two of its preferred locations for a new waste site which could process rubbish from as far away as London. Protesters say it will mean noise and pollution. Here's John Royal. Smoke from flares represents the feared pollution from the waste incinerator being considered for this area of rural Mid-Sussex between Gatwick and Brighton. And the 60-metre cherry picker 
was hired in by campaigners to demonstrate the potential impact of the waste plant's chimney. West Sussex County Council is considering allowing waste processing plants at this site, close to the famous Hickstead showground, and at a similar site less than a mile away, with Goddard's Green. We want to show if there is a, 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 an ash output that comes from the chimney, quite what it might look like, and to show that the plume dispersal, there's quite high winds here, so anything that comes out is going to be carried for quite a large distance, will be seen from many, many miles away. So this is the view from the cherry picker at 40 metres, 20 metres lower than the height of the proposed incinerator. As you can see, it's a sizeable green field site and it's thinly populated. And residents believe that's part of the reason for it being selected. They've done this by stealth. They haven't made uh, any public notification. All of a sudden we see that there are 10 sites, including this one and Goddard's Green. All greenfield sites, not brownfield sites. That just seems to be a cop-out on behalf of the West Sussex County Council where they have taken something that's easy rather than something which might be a bit harder on a brownfield site. Here there are a few people to object really. We have a good turnout today, but few people. Here's the incinerator site viewed three miles away from a bridge over the M23. Having children, my chief concerns are the health issues. Uh, both of my children have asthma, so I do worry about what the effects the, the smoke pollution will cause. West Sussex County Council declined an interview. A statement, they say new waste recycling and treatment plants are needed to meet the future needs of the county because landfill sites are running out. They say no decision on location will be taken without full public consultation. John Marlin Hicks did for Meridian Tonight. In other news, several police officers in East Sussex have been recognised for their bravery at an awards ceremony in Upfield. One of the officers was handed an outstanding frontline award for saving a woman who was drowning in the bath. Another received an outstanding innovation award after devising special garages to trap burglars. Well, it's days like today that make you feel very proud. You know, often good news stories don't always reach the press. But today is a really good news story. This is recognising my police officers, my staff, the East Sussex Division have done a fantastic job for the people of East Sussex. Yes, indeed. Britain's last working coal-fired oast house has been fired up once again at a museum near Maidstone. It's to celebrate 25 years of the Hops and Harvest Festival at Kent Life. Friends at the museum will be dressing up in traditional hop pickers' costume this weekend and using their own harvest of hops to brew a special beer for the occasion. We're going to do it by picking hops the way they were picked in the 1950s. Um, no fancy machinery, all the hops were picked by hand, and it was such a, an enjoyable time for people. Um, picking the hops and gathered around the bins, having a laugh, having a joke. A thousand years ago today, Canterbury was more or less destroyed by the Vikings. The wooden cathedral was burned to the ground and the archbishop killed. Now the city is marking the anniversary of what became known as the Danish Raid. So, what actually happened? Derek Johnson will explain. ecclesiastical establishments in the country, even then, in the Anglo-Saxon period. The Archbishop was here. The citizens had been treated behind the old Roman walls surrounding the city. They'd been able to defend the walls, which had been heroically for about three weeks, they'd been fine. But somehow, I'm not quite sure how, maybe by treachery, uh, the Vikings got in, and once they were inside, the citizens had no chance at all. The Saxons had been putting up the Viking raids for decades, especially along the south coast. The usual form was for locals to pay them off. Thorpe's army, though, was determined to go on the rampage. One casualty was Archbishop Alfie, which the windows of the cathedral tell the story of his kingdom. In an act of extraordinary bravery, he refused to be ransomed. They took him 
to the Vikings' hustings, and there they pelted him with ox bones and ox horns, and one of the drunken Vikings struck him in the head with an iron axe and killed him, and were told his blood spewed on the ground and his soul went up to heaven. The Danish raids finally ended when a Danish king, Canute, took the English throne. In 1066 in Hastings, though, the Vikings were eventually banished when the Normans conquered Britain. The anniversary is being marked by a series of events, lectures, reenactments, and cathedral services, remembering the dark days of a thousand years ago when the Vikings came calling. Derek Johnson in Canterbury for Meridian tonight. Now, a reminder of our top stories here in the South East this evening. There is anger tonight, plans to halve the number of millions of people in support of this season. By the way, councillors are demanding an urgent visit for the chief constable of Kent. And residents fighting proposals for a giant waste disposal plant at Hickstead in Sussex with used a 60 metre crane to show the visual impact of the incinerated chimney. Yes, thank you, Mr. Story. We should now match you with email us and address www.tv.com. You can always give us a ring. Girls are free and beating that lines. Other operators may jump. Show it to me. It's 10 10 Still to come on Viridian tonight, we meet the last of our four local heroes, who will be our pride of Britain. Simon's got the weather where you are, plus, will tickets to see the Paralympians from our region be snapped up? Region prepares for gold. And that sinking thing, will David Williams carry on with his tenth charity swing? Before that, though, time to get a quick preview of the stories away from the national news headlines to end with now in the Alistair Street. And the death of an innocent Iraqi man eight years ago has put the reputation of the British Army in the dock. Serious gratuitous violence like this left Baha Musa with 93 injuries and eventually cost him his life. British soldiers did it. Tonight, the effort to repair the damage done to the military's reputation. Plus, closed, boarded up and bust. The fate of so many shops on our high streets as recession threatens to return. Interest rates were kept at a record low again today, but will that do the trick? Join Mary and me for the ITV News at 6.30. Across the South, we're preparing to mark the 10th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks this weekend. In Reading, for example, they're holding a special friendship walk to bring different faiths together. Well, some say the media is giving too much attention to what happened. They fear the publicity will reopen old wounds, especially amongst Muslims who feel they've been unjustly persecuted. Our own Sangeeta Barbara has been out of the office meeting different sections of the community and sends us this report. The day the Twin Towers fell created a real fear in our Muslim communities. There was no broadcast, and we sat there and we were stopped smacked. One day was happening. Take it to us. There's going to be a backlash. I joined Ali at Southampton Community Station for Waz FM for a discussion about the impact of 9-11. Good afternoon, Ali. Great to be here in Southampton with you. These callers said they felt ostracized, vilified, terrified. Um, straight after 9-11, every time you go through the airport, you just make feel like you're a criminal or a terrorist. We have another caller. Okay. Good afternoon, caller. Hi. How did life change for you here in Southampton after 9-11? The bunch of British uh, girls and boys, they start uh, abusing me. They said to me, you have been not and you are terrorists. Was... But that wasn't the picture everywhere. In Reading after 9-11, they set up a friendship walk to bind communities together. I went to meet the organiser at Farbury Bandstand, which itself is a crossroads for all sections of the population. She told me why they will be walking again this Sunday. Well, it's simply because I believe it's needed on a very human level. You meet communities, 
feel perhaps marginalized or misunderstood. It's also not an interesting thing to feel valued. And the friendship that does that. Reading is a multicultural community. How did the events of 9 11 affect people here? For us, I think it was a challenge that one of the other on the outside of the world. is on Sunday starting at 2.30 from the Forbury Bandstand. We'll have more on the anniversary of 9-11 in tomorrow's programme. We'll catch up with our correspondent Mike Pierce, who's in New York with the families of victims from our region. Well, she's devoted the last 16 years to helping children, 19 of them in fact. Yes, and Jane Smith is the last of our four finalists who you have nominated for a Pride of Britain award. Well, this week we met the other three contenders. Tonight it's Jane's turn. She and husband Colin are devoted foster carers. Laura, Sally Malloy. <laughs> almost 90 youngsters who have benefited from Colin and Jane's love and care. The couple have selflessly devoted 16 years of their lives to taking in abused and neglected children. Well, that's not a good life. You see kids that haven't had such a good life. So I think, well, we'll give them a good life as they can. A lot of them have never had boundaries. That is the secret, really. Happiness and boundaries. And we take them away. Yeah, we take them away. Which is the joy. Because they love swimming, so they're all of the children swim to swim. Yes. And when you have swim, you think of a four year old who's never been to the seaside, doesn't know what the sea is. You know, it's, it's not right. <laughs> but they do with us, they see the sea, and they, they, they enjoy themselves. Have you put that in there? Colin and Jane don't think they're doing anything extraordinary. The children are just part of their lives. Living in a house with a flat, and all they've seen is four walls. And people probably don't speak to them half the time, whereas we do. We speak to them, and they then come out themselves and they start speaking to us. They never had any of their own time. It was solely for the children. How do you cope when you have to give them up? You can work in hospitals and change people's lives and things like that, but they change their life to change other people's lives. Sally Malloy in Salisbury for Meridian tonight. What a special couple. 
people. So we need to choose between Jane and our other three nominated heroes who you've met this week. One of them will be going to London with the chance of winning a National Pride of Britain Award. All will be revealed on our programme tomorrow when we surprise the winner, so don't miss that. But all our stories so far and all can be seen again on our website, itv.com slash meridian. Do get in touch, email meridian tonight at itv.com. There's also our Facebook page or you can follow us on Twitter. By the way, viewers at the Salisbury Transmitter area may lose their TV signal for an hour this evening. Not sure exactly when, hopefully not now, or indeed if. It's all part of work for the digital switchover. Digital UK says please bear with them. There's less than 12 months to go and tickets for the greatest disabled sports event in the world are about to go on sale. Yes, the Paralympics follow the Olympic Games and run from the 29th of August to the 9th of September next year. Only three places have been chosen to host events outside London. Rowing at Dorney Lake near Windsor, sailing at Weymouth and road cycling and time trials at Brands Hatch. Well, organisers are predicting that tickets will sell out as those of us disappointed not to get a seat at the Olympics will turn to the disabled games. Well, the three-week window for buying tickets opens tomorrow. Penny Sylvester's been looking at the build-up to Paralympics 2012. <laughs> British sitting volleyball team celebrate as they set a new world record for the longest rally this morning. Among them, Gurkha Netra Rana from Folkestone. The 27-year-old lost a leg following an explosion in Afghanistan. Kent Wyverns is a thriving sitting volleyball club, which boasts another British international in Helen Sol from Canterbury, a double amputee from Birth. A lot of disability sports are quiet, slow, and not a lot of movement. I love this game because it makes you move, it makes you feel like you've really done some exercise. But I love it because it's a team game and, you know, you make good friends and you play together as a team and hopefully you win the You need minimum equipment. You don't even need, don't even need trainers. You can, you can play on bare feet. And the thing is, you can play with any part of the body. So if you have, if you, if you have limbs, you can actually use your feet as well. Emma Wiggs from Portsmouth was left disabled by a serious virus she picked up on her gap year in Australia. She juggles training with work as a PE teacher at the Regis School in West Sussex. They're long days, but it's choices, not sacrifices, but it's, uh, it's hard graft, but it's, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity. Archery has perhaps the longest Paralympic history. It featured at the first Stoke Mandeville Games in 1948, and this week the world's best archers are in action at the Aylesbury Stadium. Buckinghamshire has a big part to play in these games, with rowing at Dorney Lake, as well as training camps at Stoke Mandeville. It's a real pilgrimage to Stoke Mandeville, to come back to the birthplace, to, to be able to compete at the place where it all began. It's a real honour. The Paralympics is the catalyst for people with disabilities to get into sport programmes like this one in Maidstone. Yay! but has been struck down with stomach problems from swallowing the water. He was trying to complete the 140 mile swim in under eight days, but is now behind schedule. He made it to Abingdon on Tuesday, warning for yesterday, and late this afternoon he reached Maple Durham on the outskirts of Reading. This report just in from Kate Cooney. <laughs> David Williams has enough energy for a wave to the crowds at Pangbourne. It's day four of his 140-mile swim down the length of the Thames. Today he will reach the halfway point, but a nasty stomach bug has left him struggling to eat and put him behind schedule. It's a very, very tough day. Day four, we've already done 52 miles. Uh, we've just passed the 60, 62 mile mark. Uh, it's very cold, the weather's not particularly pleasant, and David's very tired, so you know, there's lots of things to contend with. 
At the pub in Pangbourne, the crowds had gathered to watch David begin the next leg of his swim. He gave them a quick wave, but once in the water, it was head down and back to business. I've seen David Williams on television, really admired him, but this is real stuff. Yeah, you know, swimming in dirty water, absolutely exhausted, totally wonderful. The sheer determination that he's got is amazing. I just wanted to come down really and support him. Really was brilliant. I really am proud. We've all got some money with this. <laughs> David Williams is an experienced swimmer, but this journey is seven times the distance he did when he swam the channel in 2006. He began his latest swim at Lechlade in Gloucestershire on Monday, fully focused on the challenge ahead. It's all right to be full of bravado today, but this is day one of what will probably be eight days of swimming. And so that's what really scares me, is just the, the mental challenge. David is due to finish his swim by Big Ben early next week. He's already raised hundreds of thousands of pounds for sport relief. Kate Cooney and Pangborn for Meridian tonight. Well, I'm told that David is due to finish at Caversham in Reading at 7 o'clock this evening, and good luck to him. And you know all about swimming in the Thames. I do. I actually learned to swim in the River, river Thames. I had a rope tied around me, and I was lowered into the water from a houseboat, and that's how I learned to swim. And can I say that swallowing river water never did me any harm? Well, that's probably not the best thing to do. Not recommended. So, he's here. It's a revelation like that. If we were a newspaper, that would be a front page splash. But uh, <laughs> yesterday, we mentioned it was sink or swim for some of our woodland birds. We mentioned the plight of the declining numbers of willow tits and also lesser spotted woodpeckers. I have an update for you. Oh. Um, here's a picture taken in Rye by Mr. and Mrs. Shambrook. That's their blue tit box, which has been taken over by a woodpecker. And I've looked from top to bottom to see if it's a greater or lesser spotted one. Well, haven't spotted it anywhere. But um, we have got a lesser spotted woodpecker. This one turned up at Roger Bishop's house after his cat Daisy got hold of it and brought it back in. But he managed to rescue it, and a couple of minutes later it was up and about, and then he took it to Tiki Winkles Wildlife Hospital, who gave it a jab and released it, and it's all doing fine. Meanwhile, in Eastbourne, possibly rare, rare bird news, Alan Jennings spotted these strange looking starlings. Never seen starlings with that haircut before. So I tweeted it, as you would, to see if anyone knew what was going on. Turns out they are very young starlings. They're all, when they're born, all brown all over, and they're at the in-between stage where their brown hair hasn't gone yet and the black hair hasn't grown. So just, I, I